I'm Yuri Koda and my disease is distal myopathy. My name is Josh Grisdale and I've, I'm from Canada and near Toronto originally and I've lived in Japan for about eight years now. If you do any research on Japan, you'll know that they have an excellent transportation system. If you've traveled in it, you may have also noticed they have many features to accommodate people with physical disabilities. So here's the lowdown on how it works. It's half price for richer users. Half. Uh, there are some stations now that uh, they have a raised area for people in wheelchairs so they can drive right on the train by themselves. But of course, you know, if the destination they're going to doesn't have that kind of adaptation, then um, it's difficult to use. So, well, there are some lines that have that. Most of the lines, uh, they just have somebody who's a staff member who will help you get on the train. So when you buy your ticket, you go to the uh, staff member waiting at the ticket gate and you tell them where it is that you'd like to go. Yuriko was able to ask for a slope and quickly go on her way with her husband, but some stations have different procedures, as explained by Josh. Um, they'll usually ask you to wait a minute by the, that area, and then the staff member, other staff member will come. and they'll have a, a portable ramp with them and they'll take you to the place in the train maybe where there's a, an accessible area to sit in a wheelchair and they'll put the ramp out and help you get on the train. Traveling through the train is not something Yuriko usually does. <laughs> Did you open the door? But she wanted to show the special wheelchair section in the train, so off we went. 
Normally, I use here a special space for wheelchair users. It's very good practical because uh, so dangerous uh, hit the hit people. <laughs> Okay, sorry. And then uh, when you get to your destination or maybe at a transfer point, there'll be somebody waiting there for you. Um, they know exactly what train you are and where you are. And uh, they'll put a ramp down for you and they'll help you either get out the station or get onto your next train. So it's, it's a great system, I think. I'll get another Road condition is fabulous in Japan, but yeah, another country, uh, so gata gata. Bumping. Bumping, yeah. So buses are also quite accessible. Um, this bus is called non-step, but uh, what happens is you sort of just go to the bus loading area and you sort of make sure you indicate to the driver that you'd like to get on and uh, then the driver will sort of try to maneuver the bus into a good position and then he'll get out and uh, unlock a ramp from a special door inside the bus and lay the ramp down for you to get on. Uh, inside the bus there's two uh, seats that fold up um, to make way for uh, people, people in wheelchairs and they can sit in that area um, and then you just tell the bus driver where it is you'd like to get off and then he'll stop again for you uh, and let you out there. Now, it's not as good as the train, and uh, in the past, actually, the bus drivers weren't very well trained, and sometimes they would uh, maybe not, it's extra work for them, so they wouldn't necessarily want to help people sometimes, but there's been a lot more training put into making sure that doesn't help and happen, and um, there's also new laws coming into effect recently um, to prevent discrimination against people with disabilities, so I think that's also helping to make things easier to get around as well. Usually I use our car, by car, but uh, another prefecture like uh, Fukushima or Osaka, I use public transportation. Uh, my husband carry me to sit to the car seat and fold forward, forward, uh, my electric wheelchair and put the trunk my wheelchair. There are accessible taxis that have lifts in the back of them as well. Uh, we have to request uh, before one or two days. And now they're expensive. Uh, in, well, no more than a regular taxi, but regular taxis in Japan can be quite expensive. Very kind taxi company is same price as regular taxi. But um, the special vehicle taxi it's very um, expensive to get it, so uh, normally we have to pay more. I asked Yuriko and Josh if they planned their commutes to avoid busy travel times, and their answers, well, they were quite different. I try to you know, plan not traffic jam, okay. not busy. Because it's very dangerous for wheelchair users, and not only for wheelchair users and elderly people, and mother with strollers, it's very very dangerous. Uh, Japanese traffic jam is very clouded. I personally uh, don't necessarily put that into take that into consideration whether it's going to be crowded or not because you know I've got my schedule I'd like to keep and out my freedom as well. So. Even if it's going to be a uh, rush hour, then I'll still go on the train if that's what's needed. It can sometimes, obviously, be a little bit difficult to get on. Um, and I've, there's been a couple times where it's just been impossible to get on because of the crowding. And I've had to wait one or two trains extra. Um, but uh, there, because there's a space available for people in wheelchairs, people are generally quite considerate and will move out of the way, even though it's, it's rush hour. So it's obviously not the ideal time, but... Um, you know, if you got to go somewhere, it shouldn't stop you, I don't think, yeah. Uh, because of the space created by my wheelchair, 
and the crowding from behind stuff like that. Sometimes people end up leaning over top of me. So, uh, you know, it's been some awkward moments where people are quite close or I've had sweat drip on me or something like that from somebody else. But, you know, it makes good stories. So, yeah. I understand where both Yuriko and Josh are coming from. If you need to travel somewhere by a certain time, like for work, then go about your business. Don't let your disability stop you. But if you're not pressed for time, you'll be more comfortable, whether you're disabled or not, avoiding the hectic rush hour times. So Tenji blocks, they are braille blocks, and they are actually designed by somebody from, um, in Japan back in the 1960s for his friend who couldn't see. Uh, what they are is they're sort of a clue for people um, with visual impairments so that they can feel with their feet or with their cane um, which direction the, the street is going, uh, as well as if there are any points of uh, concern or points of warning. So uh, they're generally stripes if it's a go-ahead and at maybe corners or places where they need to take warning, there'll be little dots instead. So they'll be also at this edge of train tracks as well, so people know not to, if they go any further than the fall in the tracks kind of thing. Well, it's sort of a double-edged sword for people in wheelchairs because they can be a little bit uncomfortable to drive over um, because of the bumps and stuff. But at the same time, uh, it's also a good clue to find uh, the accessible path. So maybe if you're in um, some sort of uh, shopping area and you want to know where the elevator is, I mean, you're probably on track if you can follow those tracks because it will generally lead to the elevator or an accessible exit or something like that. So, so they have their own unique clues as well for people in wheelchairs. Japanese bathroom for wheelchair users is the most uh, convenient in the world. So I love it. When I go back to Japan, Tokyo, I'm very relieved uh, to use Japanese bathroom. So in addition to the, the, the famous uh, uh, washlets and stuff that can clean your behind for you, uh, one other great thing about toilets in Japan is for people with disabilities, they have a thing called the dare demo toilet, uh, which are everybody's toilet. <laughs> So many assistive devices in bathroom for wheelchair users. This bathroom is very large. Large, it's okay. Yeah, large is good. <laughs> <laughs> and there are grip, special grip. Two, okay. Yes. And back. And very accessible for wheelchair users. Sitting here, wash hands, washing hands. So it's easier to wash your hands? Yeah, I think so. Emergency call. Yeah. Uh, depending on where it is, it may also have a changing bed um, or something for cleaning um, colostomy bags and stuff like that as well. We can turn around in my wheelchair. Hi again. <laughs> <laughs> The Japanese Donata demo toilets looked very useful, but I didn't truly understand their significance until it was contrasted against bathrooms in the U.S. Uh, for example, in U.S., there are uh, bathroom uh, space for wheelchair users, but it's separated in men and women and inside. So for me, it's uh, difficult to go inside with my husband. But in Japan, there are special bathrooms for wheelchair users, so we can go inside together. And so instead of um, you know, the, the women's toilet and the men's toilet, there's usually one more toilet in between those two. Um, I know in Canada, they would usually have an accessible stall at the back of the toilet, um, which is maybe often quite narrow and difficult to use. So these are pretty much everywhere in Japan, which is just incredible. Um, even if you go to a park, they'll have a separate washroom for people with disabilities in the middle of some residential area. So uh, I think that's one of the, the big things where Japan is definitely leading. Japanese toilets are awesome. Thank you. 
they use the term barrier free for to mean accessibility. But so if you ever look for anything online, so you need to look for something universal design or barrier free. So it generally incorporates things, mostly physical adaptations. So slopes and elevators and uh, wider doors and everything like that. Uh, in hotels, it would maybe mean that uh, the bathroom is bigger and that there's a shower chair available. Um, and uh, for a tourist attraction, there would be maybe an alternate route or uh, some sort of adaptation made to it. For example, Asakusa, the temple in Soji in Asakusa, they've got an elevator outside of the temple now and they've um, made it look like it's part of the temple. So um, they've adapted it in that way, but to make it barrier free. Uh, first of all, I would say go for it. Um, it's maybe scary because there's not enough information. Um, it's sort of a newer tourist destination and a lot of people are, aren't thinking about oh, people going with disabilities, so they don't put that kind of information on. But it's actually much easier than I thought it was going to be as well. I asked if not knowing Japanese would cause issues. I wouldn't say it affects them too much more than an average tourist other than in some specific areas perhaps with the, because the fact that you can't just get on a, a train by yourself, you would need to interact with the staff at the station. People are obviously, because of the Olympics coming, are putting a very big effort into learning English and because also there's also a ton of new uh, foreign tourists coming lately. So people are eager to try out their English. Um, so that could be a little bit of a challenge, but if you remember the phrase, I would like to go here, please give me, let me use the ramp, then that should be, I think, fine. After that, it'd be probably negotiating, negotiating with hotels as to what your needs may be. Um, uh, sometimes they don't have the same um, type of facilities that they would have in a North American accessible hotel. And uh, if you have specific needs, then you might need to make sure they are met before you make uh, the decision. I've read the accounts of disabled people who have said they feel like an outsider because they have a disability. I've also read many accounts of non-Japanese in Japan who have felt like outsiders. So I asked Josh, what does it feel like to be a double outsider? Because in Japan he's both foreign and disabled. In some ways I'm used to being an outsider so because of my disability and you know no matter what country you go and kids especially you know they'll, they'll look you know, what's, what's going on kind of thing. Um, and so sometimes I, I kind of laugh when people who are foreigners come to Japan and they say, everybody looking at me, and it feels so awkward. And I was like, well, that's always like that wherever I go. Um, so I never necessarily felt any extra eyes on me in Japan um, or anything like that. And, uh, but in some ways also, in the opposite way, I feel less like a disabled person here because of, I'm often, it's more my, foreignness that sticks out than my disability. So it's almost as if my disability sort of blend, sort of goes away into the background in some situations. So yeah, I mean, it's in some ways I'm double sticking out, but at the same time, you know, I'm sticking out no more than any other foreigner in a way, so. Josh has actually created a site to help English speaking disabled people navigate Japan. Um, well, I have a full-time job, but as a hobby, I like to, uh, just sort of share about uh, accessibility in Japan through my website, Accessible Japan. Uh, right now, it's a lot of sort of uh, general information, for example, on transportation, uh, you know, getting around, some helpful phrases for people with disabilities, um, as well as I'm trying to go to different sites around uh, Tokyo and uh, Kyoto as well. And uh, just sort of, so people would say, I want to go there, but what's it like for in a, in a wheelchair? So I look at it from that perspective and uh, sort of tell people about that, uh, as well as I have some hotel listings for places that have accessible rooms as well. So, Yuriko goes by the name of Wheelchair Walker and makes excellent videos about traveling Japan and the world in a wheelchair. Please watch the Wheelchair Walker. There are some videos with English subtitle. I want to inform about accessibility in Japan. And uh, I didn't know how to get uh, Super Express Shinkansen. <laughs> or a uh, board airplane. 
for mandarin picking. Well, many things. Uh, I couldn't enjoy my life, but information can help us. I really want to introduce about uh, accessibility in Japan. If I do, I will be able to see uh, disabled people in Japan from foreign countries. I just like to say I would encourage people to not think it is impossible, but and uh, you know it may take a bit of extra work to figure if they can come here or not. But um, if they want to access my website and send me a message on that, then I, I can try my best anyways to f find out things I don't know about um, or uh, assure them that yeah, there's no problem, so. Awesome. Don't give up, come on, this man. We're waiting for you. Thank you very much. I wanted to give a special shout out to Yuriko and Josh for giving me a peek into their lives. They're so helpful in answering questions, letting me film them, and even giving me some additional footage. Also a special thank you to Agatha who helped translate. Now there's a part two which will talk about living with a disability in Japan. So we'll talk about things like living independently, government assistance, and getting helpers. This video is part of a series of social documentaries about Japan. If you'd like to support them, I've set up a Patreon page where you can do so. Other topics I'll be exploring are homelessness, working, housing, schools, just to name a few. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll catch you on the flip side.